Let me start by asking a question. Ideally, what should patient care be? You know, we think about patient care as we're providing a service to our patients. Um, but I think that falls short in some ways, ideally. And I'm talking about ideal now. And I think ideally what we should think about patient care as is a collaboration, where the patient and the provider are collaborating around the patient's health. If we think about healthcare as a collaboration, then it's, it sort of opens our mind to think about different ways of doing things. Rather than thinking about healthcare as just providing a service to a patient, because that's very passive. That's a uh, that's healthcare as a spectator sport. That's that's almost healthcare as a a car wash where the patient is the car passing through that car wash passively. But if we think about it as a collaboration, then it becomes very different. Then we talk about the things that are necessary in any collaboration, outside of healthcare or in healthcare. So the first element is communication. You need to have free flowing communications among people who are collaborating. Next sharing in decision making. Next, it's mutual respect. We need to respect each other in this collaboration. It's not an I-thou relationship. It's not one person has the power and the other doesn't. We've got to respect what each other are bringing to the table. Then there's information sharing. A collaboration is not going to work if we're if somebody's hoarding all the information, not sharing it with the others. We need to be working from a common database of information. And finally, the parties in the collaboration need to be engaged with one another. If you're not engaged with one another and the collaboration process, that collaboration will fail. So if you think about healthcare this way, well, that becomes very interesting because these are elements that actually can improve the healthcare process as well. Collaboration applied to healthcare is participatory medicine. We've defined participatory medicine as a movement in which network patients shift from being mere passengers to being responsible drivers of their health and in which providers encourage and value them as full partners. That's a very different model than traditional health care and it's very, very important. The Society for Participatory Medicine was founded in 2009 and it's an organization that's, that's focused on promoting this idea of, of participatory medicine. And we're doing it in many different ways. One is by, by fostering uh, discussions about this and building community around this. Next, it's by uh, doing advocacy, public policy outreach, trying to influence the, uh, the, the public policy milieu in which this is taking place. Next, it's research. We have a journal of participatory medicine, and we promote uh, dissemination of research results in this area that support participatory medicine. And finally, it's education. Things like this video today is about educating people, and we need to educate all the parts of the healthcare system. This is not an organization that is just about the patients. It is about the patients, but it's also about the other parts of the healthcare system as well. So it's everything from self-care to how, what happens when the patient comes into the healthcare system and how do we make sure that all of the parts of that healthcare system are working together to make sure we have the right environment for participatory medicine. I encourage you to check out the Society for Participatory Medicine at participatorymedicine.org and join us. There are benefits to participatory medicine, and I'm just going to lump them into several large areas. One is reduce costs. One of the things that is not effective in healthcare, not cost effective, is when we have to do the same things over and over again. Or we have to say the same things over and over again. Or we're, we're prescribing a healthcare plan that a, a patient hasn't bought into, and so they're not doing that, and so we have to re-prescribe medicines, bring patients back, whatever. Okay. The other thing is, is that if we can encourage self-care, right, if we can encourage patients to take care of themselves whenever possible, that can keep them out of the healthcare system. All these things reduce costs. Next, there's improved satisfaction. It turns out it's way more satisfying to practice participatory medicine than sort of the traditional stuffy healthcare. It really makes a lot of sense for both the patients and their families as well as the, uh, the providers, the doctors and nurses and other members of the healthcare team. And finally, it's better outcomes. And if you think about all these things together, that's really the triple aim that we keep talking about striving towards. So it's very exciting. If we can push towards there, there there's increasing evidence that we will get closer to the triple aim. Now, there are prerequisites for, for a participatory medicine, things that in order for patients to get engaged that they kind of need. One is they need to be able to communicate. There needs to be communication not just in the office, but outside the office as well. We need 
to do better than just office visits and just phone calls, for example. Then there's convenience. We've got to make it convenient for patients to access the healthcare system. We get mad at patients when they, they uh, can't have to cancel an appointment and don't make a follow-up appointment, or they don't re re uh, renew the prescriptions that we've given them. And, and often the reason is, is that it's so hard to do it in our traditional system. We don't make it easy for them. Finally, it's information. How can we expect patients to be engaged in their health care if we don't give them the information tools that they need? Information, not just generic tools about their condition, but also information about them, their test results, their office notes. Um, those are things that they can really act upon. And if you, if you give patients all these things, if you provide that kind of milieu, then you can get patients involved in their care, and that's very important. But there are these barriers that exist. And some of these barriers are on the part of the providers in healthcare, the doctors and others in the healthcare system. Some are on the part of the patients, and some are on the part of the systems, our offices, our healthcare systems, our, uh, our, our hospitals. So as far as providers go, arrogance is a huge barrier. So if I am very arrogant, I, I say to you, you know, if you want to know what's best for you, I will tell you. I'll tell you what's best for you. Or, or you can't handle the truth, so I'm going to just filter this information to you. This is arrogance, and this really gets in the way of participatory medicine. In general, poor communication habits are another part that, that gets in the way. Um, so if I'm not good at communicating, if I'm not good at listening, asking questions, hearing you, then that's a barrier to uh, participatory medicine. Then there are healthcare system issues, uh, inconvenience. As I mentioned before, making it hard to get that prescription or that appointment or whatever. It's sort of interesting that the rest of the world has moved on outside of healthcare, which is that it, you know, we do things that we used to do through people, through complex processes. Now we do them online, very simply. Think about getting cash from a cash machine instead of going to a teller, making your uh, travel arrangements online instead of going to a travel agent. But healthcare, we're still stuck. 20 years ago. And then there's lack of transparency. Um, again, we need patients to be able to see their own health care information online. And finally, on the part of the patient, there's a, a literacy issue. Whether it's liter literacy because a patient doesn't speak English as their first language, or, um, or, or they, uh, you know, have, or they do speak English but barely, or they just don't understand the health concepts we're talking about, or the numbers that we're talking about. Poor numeracy is a barrier. So these are all barriers, too, and it's important that we meet people where they are, work with them. All these are barriers, but these are all surmountable barriers. Now, if we look overall at the online health habits of U.S. adults, it's very interesting. Eighty percent of online adults have gone online to look for health care information. That's rising over time, and every day, this is humbling, every day more people search for health information online than go to see one of us. And also humbling is the fact that over half the time, this is changing their behavior. It's causing them to get a test, go to the doctor, not go to a doctor, not take a medication. Whatever it is, it's changing behavior. A third have read about others' health experiences online, which is often driving behavior. A quarter have tracked their own health information online. And a third use social media for health. Quite interesting. If we understand these trends, though, then we can meet patients where they are. We don't need to shut them down. We can actually encourage this because this is actually all very important. And every time our patients are going online, they're becoming more activated. They're learning about their health. And if they're willing to come to us with some questions, that becomes a teachable moment. So what do you need to do today to incorporate participatory medicine in your practice? It's not so hard. It's really an attitudinal change, first and foremost. But, but in terms of concrete steps, use a patient portal. Put up a patient portal that will allow patients to communicate, allow for convenience transactions, the appointments, the prescriptions, the referrals, and so on, and allow patients to have access to their, their records online, their test results, their appointments, their problems, their medications, and so on, even their office notes. Ask every patient what they know and where they get health information. This is important because we know this is changing their decisions, changing their health behaviors. This next one is interesting. It's a matter of admitting when you don't know something. Traditionally in healthcare, we're sort of taught, as, uh, through medical school even, almost never to say, I don't know. 
We don't say this to our teachers. We don't say this to nurses. We don't say this to patients, for sure. But, but it's very important to do this because we all know that we don't know everything. We can't know everything there is to know. Okay, so we need to be honest with ourselves and we need to be honest with our patients. So rather than turning a deaf ear or stepping out of the office or, or, uh, or making up an answer on the spot as best we can, um, we don't have to do that. We can turn to the patient and say, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. And when you get comfortable doing that, then go on and say, let's look it up together. And just spend a few moments right there with the patient and begin to get an answer to that question. Um, next, encourage patients to connect with other patients. We need to recognize that we, doctors, don't have a lock on all information. And even all the best online published information you can find, even from the National Cancer Institute, it's not always the, the it, it, it's not complete. It's not complete because it's not complete until you really talk to people who have been through this and who really know the score. And talking to patient communities online is really, really important. Now, some of us are accustomed to sending patients to support groups that might meet in the hospital basement on Tuesday evenings, but that's not always convenient for patients to go to that particular uh, meeting session, and so they're not getting a benefit from it. Furthermore, there not, may not be enough patients with their particular condition, think multiple myeloma or metastatic renal cell carcinoma, to actually have an online support community for them. The nice thing about the web is it breaks down the barriers of time and place. And so patients can find communities online. And the nice thing about these mature communities is that the information becomes self-correcting. The more you hear things, the, 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 uh, the, if they're accurate, they're going to bubble up to the top. And if they're things that are just outlandish ideas, the rest of the community is going to shut them down. But the point is, each time the patient's getting some insight, and they may bring that back to you and ask you questions, ask you for your judgment and wisdom, because mutual respect. Patients bring in something, and I'm bringing something, right? That's mutual respect. So encouraging patients to connect with other patients is helpful, not just in deciding on therapies, but also in, uh, in understanding what they're going to go through when they choose a therapy. It really can be life-saving. Um, incorporate patient preferences into decision-making, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in just a moment. And then finally, let patients help throughout your practice. Let patients help in their care, but also encourage patients to help by setting up a patient family advisory board for your practice. That's really powerful. Listen to those patients. Let them help. Understand what they're bringing to the table. In terms of sharing decision-making, shared decision-making, invite patients to participate in all decisions. Make sure you're presenting all the options to them and provide information on the benefits and the costs of each of those decisions. Assist them in any way in evaluating the options based on that patient's goals and preferences. You should know for every patient, what are your preferences? What are the, what are the things you want to accomplish? What are your goals? What do you want the outcomes to be? Work with them on that. Facilitate the deliberation and decision-making process and implement uh, shared decision-making throughout your practice. So by doing all the things that I've spoken about, we can break down these barriers have patients be more engaged in their health, and we can engage with them. We can collaborate, and we can practice participatory medicine together.